The 18 most inflammatory foods. Let's jump right in. These are foods that trigger an immune response, trigger inflammation. However, they're not ones that we need to 100% avoid all the time. All food triggers an inflammatory response. Some foods just trigger a sort of unnatural inflammatory response. It's a little bit much. So the first one, margarine. Now margarine falls into the category of one that you should just never really consume. There's no adequate reason to consume margarine these days. Okay, it is a hydrogenated fat, which means they have taken sort of an artificial way of making it a saturated fat. They add a hydrogen atom to make it saturated. This makes it a trans fat. Now the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition took a look at over 800 participants and they found that the more trans fats they consumed, the higher the amount of interleukin-6 and C-reactive protein. These are major inflammatory markers that we could see. This was especially high in those that already had high BMI. So people that have more body fat on them are probably going to respond even more negatively to margarine. At that rate, literally just use butter. It is going to be less inflammatory. Number two is going to be sodas. Now this doesn't come as any surprise, but the thing we have to look at is that high concentrations of sugar can inhibit antioxidant functions within the body. So it's not the sugar itself causing the inflammation per se. I mean, yes, we can say that too, probably based on other research, but by inhibiting sort of the endogenous antioxidants within our body from doing their job, we lead ourselves to more inflammation down the line. What this does is this damages the mitochondria. So when you have high amounts of oxidative stress without the ability to mitigate it, you have damaged mitochondria that cannot produce energy well that therefore trigger an inflammatory response not to mention the synthetic additives, not to mention the colorings and all kinds of stuff. Now, people are going to ask, so if this is the case, is a diet soda better? It all depends on context. We don't have enough research to pin against a diet soda for me to 100% say with certainty that it's better or worse. But I will say, based on what we do know about the concentration of calories, sugar, synthetic additives, and all kinds of stuff in regular soda, if I had to choose, I would probably choose a diet soda over a regular soda, but that's just me. Number three goes kind of in line with this too. It's high fructose corn syrup. Now, this is interesting because there's a study published in the journal Mediators of Inflammation. Full disclaimer, it was a rodent model study, but what they found was intriguing. They found when they gave them concentrated fructose, in a dose-dependent fashion, the more the concentrated fructose that they had, the more inflammation they had. They had increases in IL-6, increases tumor necrosis factor, and decreases in anti-inflammatory interleukin-10, which would normally combat that. And the researchers noticed that most of it came down to them damaging their gut. So actually triggering that whole leaky gut, over-marketedly hyped thing, but it's a real thing, at least when we see in this concentration. So that leads to an inflammatory response because you basically have pathogenic material that should stay in the gut, leaking into the bloodstream. This is something I just don't see a realistic reason for us to be having high fructose corn syrup either. That doesn't mean if you see it on a label, like in one obscure food that you have every now and then that you have to run the other direction. I just don't think it needs to be a staple part of your diet in any way, shape or form. Number four is going to be rancid fats. Probably one of the most inflammatory things that you can consume. Now, what exactly is that? Okay, that's going to be an oil that has gone bad. So soybean oil, any of these oils that get left out, they are exposed to light, exposed to heat, exposed to high heat where they denature, these become very rancid and they become oxidized. And these oxidized fats, when they come into our body, they can damage cellular membranes, they can cause more oxidative stress within our body. So if you've got that bottle of corn oil that's been sitting on the counter, or even under the shelf in high heat without air conditioning or something, after a while, that stuff's gonna go really bad. So how often can you consume it? Well, you have to ask yourself, when is it ever a good time to consume knowingly a rancid oil? It just does not make sense, right? It doesn't make any sense to electively choose to consume a rancid oil. Next up, number five is kind of a trick one. Okay, it's going to be protein powders, but not all protein powders. It's going to be protein powders that contain a bunch of the garbage in them. So a lot of them contain like soybean oil, they contain corn oil, they contain corn syrup solids, all in like a powdered form. So they're a little bit tricky because a lot of times when these oils are put into like a powder form, they are treated at a high heat, they're heat sprayed. This will make them oxidized. So even something that's as good as whey protein powder, which I'm a big fan of, 
can a lot of times have total garbage in it. Number six is going to be an ingredient. That's going to be emulsifiers. Be very careful. We have to remember with emulsifiers, we're doing something unnatural. Okay, we're chemically making like oil and water mix, which just doesn't happen, right? If we look at a study published in Microbiome, it took a look at 20 different emulsifiers. 18 out of the 20 emulsifiers had negative impacts on the microbiome in very similar fashions. But there were two serious outliers. One was carboxymethylcellulose and the other one was polysorbate 80. And these triggered such a negative effect on the microbiome that it actually launched a full-scale immune response. So the microbiome became so damaged that the immune system actually started changing. Unfortunately, these are two emulsifiers that we still see in products today. So be very careful when you see any emulsifiers. It's just a, kind of a red flag. And when you start looking at like peanut butters and stuff like that, just get the ones you have to mix. It's better that way. Next is going to be processed meats, not to be confused with red meat. Okay, a study published in the American College of Nutrition took a look at processed meats and it found that the higher the consumption of processed meat, the higher C-reactive protein, the higher the leptin, the higher just overall inflammatory response. Unfortunately, they roped red meat into this study too. They clearly said in the study, red meat and processed meat, and then they roped the results together. Red meat is not going to be inflammatory unless you're eating a ton of it, just like anything else is going to be inflammatory. Processed meats have the synthetic additives, have the preservatives, have the weird things in them that cause the issues, have the carcinogens. Let it be known, there are also other processed meats like parma ham, prosciutto. These things are air dried and just cured with salt. So technically they're processed, but they actually have biopeptides that are good for you. So enjoy things like real fresh parma ham and real fresh prosciutto. We're not talking about the same as like bologna, which is, well, quite honestly, bologna. Next up is going to be high glycemic cereals. So anything like sweetened instant oatmeal, anything like, a, uh, like Rice Krispies, which are actually very high glycemic because the rice is puffed. Any sugary cereal, that's kind of obvious. Bottom line is that when you have these glycemic spikes that are constant and you're starting your day with it every day, We've seen in literature that glycemic spikes stay elevated like 120, 240 minutes after consumption. Okay, this can potentially lead to insulin resistance, which leads to even higher glucose, which does lead to inflammatory responses within the body. That's why there's such a direct correlation with high blood sugar and inflammation. A lot of this simply has to do with oxidative stress in the body. So a lot of the things I'm talking about, the refined starches, all this stuff is related to the glycemic effect of various foods and what that is doing downstream, how it's impacting how we actually neutralize free radicals, things that damage DNA, all of that. I put a link down below for something I started taking about two or three years ago, but I've known the owner for a number of years, like five, six years. It's called Organifi. They have a red juice and a green juice powder it's just a really good way to get powerful antioxidants. And people always ask me if I take a greens powder. And the candid answer is I do not take a greens drink every day. I get a lot of nutrients in my diet. I'm very, very particular about that. But the days that I do not, I do utilize Organifi. And especially when I'm traveling, I use their greens powder. So I use their greens powder because it's a way for me to at least get some greens in. No, it doesn't replace the fiber, it doesn't replace real food, I'm being honest with you. But one that I do like to use almost daily, especially if I'm low carb, is their reds powder because that's got all the antioxidants and the entire profile that I'd get from fruit if I just don't wanna have a bunch of carbohydrates from fruit. Nothing wrong with carbs from fruit, but there's just days where I need to limit my carbs. So I'm getting the antioxidants, I'm getting the nutrition, I'm getting the micronutrients. I just think it's a really good potential way to add antioxidants in your diet, have a potential anti-inflammatory effect on some things. And it's just a great way to start the day. So that link is down below. And if you use that code THOMAS2023, that saves you 20% off whatever you want from them. So 20% off their reds, their greens, their gold, a number of different products that they have as well. So the code is good for their entire website, but I recommend their reds and their greens. That link is down below in the description, just below this video. Number nine is going to be fried foods. Now, I'm not just talking fried chicken. Anything that is fried, okay, once you increase the heat so much with an oil and you heat a protein so much, you trigger what are called advanced glycation in products. This is where it's problematic. You know, you can eat all this stuff in its normal temperature and it's different when it's heated to the nth degree. 
Not to mention anything that's fried is gonna be fried in oil that's probably rancid unless you're doing it at home and using a good quality like avocado oil or something like that. Number 10 is refined grains. Now I mentioned this because people rope all grains together. And although I do not recommend people saying like, just going out and eating a bunch of grains, whether they're whole or not, we do need to have a clear line in the sand between whole grains and refined grains. The Journal of Nutrition published a paper that took a look at refined grain consumption and found that it increased what is called plasminogen activation inhibitor, one. And when that is increased, that is sort of a marker of inflammation beginning. What they found is that whole grains decreased this. This isn't a license to go out and eat a bunch of whole grains. I still think starches should probably be limited. However, it shows us a clear difference between a refined starch and a whole grain or a whole starch. Very, very different things. So very much so pay attention to that. Number 11 is going to be alcohol. Now there was a study that was published in Alcohol and Alcoholism that took a look at 1,330 people. Okay, and it found that there was in a dose dependent fashion, a very clear relationship between alcohol consumption and inflammation. Now, the likely reason with this is the damage that it does to the gut, okay? By allowing what are called lipopolysaccharides to leak out of the blood, uh, gut into the bloodstream, you're dealing with an inflammatory response. Not to mention the neuroinflammation, not to mention the uh, hepatic inflammation, the inflammation at the liver level. We're starting to see now that it just doesn't make sense to drink. Like, we used to say like, oh, drinking in moderation is actually good for you. That's recently been debunked. Like, we're seeing more and more bodies of research coming out in opposition of that. There's no reason from a health standpoint to drink. Even if you feel like it's mentally improving how you are, you could find a lot of reasons to not. But if it's something that's difficult for you, I still think maybe having one drink a week is probably not the end of the world. But I think that's where we're at now. I'm thinking we're starting to see that one drink a week is where we should be. If you don't like it, it's unfortunate because that's just where the research is showing. This next one's gonna make some enemies, but we need to talk about it. It's number 12 and it's MSG. Here's the deal with MSG. It is derived from something that's natural. It is derived, it, it is fine, it is available naturally, okay? That doesn't mean that in a concentrated form it's what we should be consuming. First of all, it excites the brain a little too much to get that umami effect. It's, it's amping up the brain. But that's not the only effect. There's a study published in Basic and Clinical Pharmacology and Toxicology. Now, although this was done in mice, it illuminated a lot. They found that MSG increased the expression of microRNA for interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Again, the two big inflammatory cytokines we always look at. Now, microRNA is a complex thing, but when you increase the expression of it, you essentially are increasing sort of these little tangents of IL-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Not to mention, what the MSG is trying to disguise. Because a lot of times MSG is added just to like buffet food and things like that to make it taste a little bit better. So who knows what the MSG is disguising, right? So we got all kinds of problems that come to be. They also found there are increases in resistin and leptin in the visceral fat. So it's causing our inflammatory tissue, like visceral fat, to be even more inflammatory and express more inflammatory effects. We definitely don't want that. Number 13 is one that I'm also gonna catch some flack for, but I have to mention it here because it's a toss up, right? It's the world of aspartame. Can I say with certainty that aspartame is inflammatory? No, I can't. Okay, but the bottom line is that we are seeing some research, particularly in people that are dealing with autoimmune issues like rheumatoid arthritis, where aspartame might be more inflammatory for them. So my concern is that if we're seeing it manifested in people that already have immune issues, is it doing something even at a small scale in regular people? Now, the question always is, is, okay, if aspartame allows me to be in a slight caloric deficit where I can have lower inflammation, is that a net positive? Is that better? I still probably think yes. I think aspartame probably isn't designed to be in the human body, and I think we might see some research coming out, but I also think that like, if it's what allows you to keep 100 pounds off, then I think it's acceptable. But I have to mention here because we are seeing mixed bodies of research here, inflammatory at certain levels, so it would be foolish for me not to mention it. Number 14, even healthy potato chips. Now I mentioned this because there's a lot of potato chips out there that are like cassava flour, tapioca starch, uh, you know, rice flour, but they're still fried the same way. It's not the starch that's really the problem. Okay, yes, yeah, so with a potato chip, a lot of times you do have something refined, or with a corn chip, you have a refined starch, but it's the high heat, the rancid oils, that exposure to the high heat with the rancid oils, creating those advanced glycation end products that are making it an inflammatory food. Healthy or unhealthy, independent of inflammation? I don't know, is a siete tortilla chip better than a corn tortilla chip? 
whatever. The point is, is that the high heat, the rancid oils mixed with the starch is what is a problem when it comes to inflammation. Number 15, salad dressings. Okay, what the heck? Here's the deal, like go down any salad dressing aisle of your grocery store and look at the back of it. You're gonna see on that label, you're gonna see a bunch of emulsifiers, you're gonna see a bunch of additives, you're gonna see garbage oil, like soybean oil that's probably rancid, you're gonna see a bunch of stuff that shouldn't be in something that is trying to be healthy. You're trying to do the right thing by eating a salad. So unfortunately, most of them you should probably just not deal with. You're gonna see stabilizers, uh, look for things like corn syrup, Look for things like disodium inositate. You definitely want to avoid that one. Okay, and go for something like Primal Foods, Primal Kitchen. Okay, go for those kinds of salad dressings. Or better yet, just make your own. Olive oil, vinegar, some seasoning, some salt, whatever. Number 16, gluten if you're sensitive to it. Here's what's up with gluten. We're seeing more and more and more and more people being diagnosed with celiac. But we're seeing even larger amounts of people that just say they don't feel good when they eat gluten. What's going on? Is gluten the actual problem? I think it's our overconsumption of gluten over the last half a century that's probably become the issue, right? People are becoming more sensitive to gluten. That's definitely not a lie, and there's more and more people getting diagnosed, so what are we, what are we seeing here? Well, what we do seem to see is that in people that are sensitive, when they consume gluten, their body triggers an antibody reaction to the gluten, namely TPO antibodies, and it can trigger some gut inflammation and actually damage the vili within the gut. So this doesn't mean everyone's gonna have an issue. I know people that can eat gluten to their heart's desire and not have a problem. Whereas personally, I have gluten and I feel like I get hit by a train for like a solid day. My wife with autoimmune conditions, when she has gluten, her TPO antibodies go up and her Hashimoto thyroiditis comes back. So there's something going on that we can't put our finger on entirely, but we know that maybe if we're sensitive, we just shouldn't be eating it. It's clearly inflammatory for some people, so we probably need to throttle our intake. This next one is crazy. Excessive salt, particularly in one sitting. Listen, I am a salt fan. I work out a lot, I sweat a lot, I move a lot, and I have a lot of cognitive demand. Salt is good for all those things. Where excessive salt becomes a problem is for people that are not really active. And it's not about the hypertension thing, it's more than that. There's a study published in Pediatrics that took a look at 766 adolescents, and they found the more they consume salt, this excess sodium intake, it led to increased tumor necrosis factor, it led to increased IL-6, and increases in leptin. Now the potential reason here is it may actually prompt T cells to trigger more of an immune response. So basically trigger the T cells to be more active. So whatever reason we have going on here, we're starting to see it more. So it doesn't mean you avoid salt. It means you limit salt to the amount that you need. And if you're active, you replenish that salt, but don't say like go have concentrated amounts of salt all the time or at least try to reduce the salt and see what happens and how you feel because you're going to feel inflammation. I don't want to demonize salt. I'm a big fan of it. I just don't think that if you're sedentary and inactive, adding salt to the equation is going to help you just because we're hearing it talked about in other channels for active people and how we shouldn't be limiting it. The last one is a weird one, but it's one that's definitely inflammatory. That's going to be swordfish. Now, swordfish is very, very high in mercury, and mercury is something that we have seen in various bodies of research to be very inflammatory. The Journal of Clinical Hypertension published a paper demonstrating that the more mercury you consume, the more reactive oxygen species, the more overall oxidative stress, and the more overall inflammation. So how often should you consume swordfish? It's one of those things where you have it on a very rare occasion. Like you're going out on vacation and you wanna have swordfish once or twice a year. It just doesn't make sense. Like the nutrient value is not crazy high. It's high in protein, but it's not a fatty fish. So you're not getting a lot of omega-3s. You're just getting mercury and protein. You might as well eat a chicken breast and not get the mercury. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.